Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that is truly devastating how it all played out. I originally heard about this case on the news and I really didn't believe the headlines until I looked at the information for myself and found out exactly what happened. It's just the most horrific and senseless crime. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and give a quick shout out to Cometeer. I've been obsessed with their coffee lately. Their coffee comes in frozen pucks and you have so many unique, amazing flavors to choose from. You can either melt the puck by running it under hot water in your mug or you place the puck in your fridge overnight to melt and then you put it in your iced coffee in the morning. That's what I love to do. It's literally the easiest, most convenient way to make your coffee. So if you want to try it out, make sure you go ahead and use my link down below and use code Rachel Shannon for $40 off. Okay, so with that being said, let's get into today's case. 33-year-old Veronica Youngblood is originally from Argentina. I'm not exactly sure when she moved to the U.S., but according to her trial, it appears that she grew up in poverty. She had her first daughter, Sharon, when she was only 16 years old. According to her, she then started work as a sex worker to make enough money to get by. By 2007, Veronica met a man named Ronald Youngblood, a U.S. Navy pilot stationed in Buenos Aires. He had been a customer of Veronica's, a sex work customer. The two then began a dating relationship, and by 2009, the two went to Las Vegas, Nevada to get married. Again, Ron worked with the U.S. Navy, so that required him to travel all around the world. But even with this, after getting married, Veronica found stability in having a husband who has a job and is able to help take care of her daughter. After getting married by 2012, the two went on to have a daughter of their own named Brooklyn. At the time of their deaths, Sharon was 15 years old and Brooklyn was only 5 years old. Sharon was described as being sweet and kind-hearted. She was known for her willingness to help others. She was on the cheerleading team at Oakton High School where she was a freshman. She was also a competitive figure skater. Her coach, Lynette Carroll, said that she coached Sharon for about 4 years. She described that Sharon did really well at competitions and did well in school. She was a bright teenager with an even brighter future. Sharon would talk about how she one day wanted a career in singing. She had a great group of friends and she was well-liked by those who knew her at school. Five-year-old Brooklyn was described as a smart, sweet, loving, adorable little girl who loved animals. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a lot about her, but just looking through posts of her on her dad's Facebook, she is just the cutest little thing and she was so loved by her family. However, the relationship between Veronica and Ron was a very tumultuous one. There are allegations on both sides as to who was the abuser, but it seemed that it may have gone both ways. By 2014, when Ron was stationed in Honduras, Veronica called the local police to report that she and her husband had gotten into an argument and he became physically abusive. During that time, according to family members, it seems that he found out that Veronica had cheated on him. After that, the family said that things got even worse between the two of them. Some said that this caused Ron to become even more controlling, jealous, and possessive. They said that in Honduras, he started denying her access to transportation, money, and even the internet. So at one point, Veronica sought help from the U.S. Embassy to try to get emergency removal to get out of Honduras and back to the U.S., which was granted. After being stationed in Honduras, Ron was transferred to the Navy offices in D.C., after this, the couple moved to Florida, where they were actually separated, but continued living together. After being in Florida, the two then moved to Oakton, Virginia. At that point, the couple started the proceedings to get a divorce. Through all of this, though, the couple continued living together in a townhouse. Apparently, it was so they could raise the two girls together, and because Veronica didn't have a job, so she couldn't afford to live on her own. But either way, the process for divorce and custody of the kids made the relationship grow even more tumultuous than it already was. 
At one point during this, apparently Veronica applied for a student loan and listed Ron as the co-signer without his knowledge or permission. But then by September of 2016, the court decided that the two could continue living together in Oakton and share custody of Brooklyn. There would be no spousal payments or child support payments involved on either side. But then, by October of 2016, Ron actually filed for a protective order against Veronica. In this protective order, Ron claimed that Veronica took his cell phone and threw it in the toilet. She allegedly poured water on his laptop and scratched his car as well. As a result of this protective order, Veronica was ordered to move out of the home in Oakton. She also had to stay 500 feet away from Ron and Brooklyn, pending a hearing that was scheduled for two weeks later. However, the results of this hearing have been sealed. Finally, by October 31st, 2016, the divorce was finalized. However, I feel like Veronica was allowed to come back into the home after the hearing because after that, the two were living together once again. Things were quiet for a while after that until March of 2018 when the couple returned to court. They filed a 14-page joint consent order. In the order, it said that they both wanted to move with the two girls to Sedalia, Missouri by August of 2018. They wanted to move to Missouri because that is where most of Ron's family had lived. In this agreement that the two of them both sort of worked up and brought to the court, it was stated that Veronica would get her own apartment, which was located within 30 miles of her ex-husband. It was said that Ron would pay the rent for the next three years, and during that time, they would share custody of Brooklyn. The court then agreed to this, and so the move was set. However, by April 13th of 2018, Veronica changed her mind. She hired a new lawyer and decided to amend the custody agreement. She said that since filing this agreement, she was actually offered a job where she would be making a good full-time salary but this would require her to stay in Virginia. She said that at this time, she was also in the process of getting her own residence so that she could live apart from Ron and support herself without his help. In this new amendment, she requested full custody of Brooklyn. This dispute went to hearing by July of 2018, and in this hearing, it was decided that no changes would be granted they were both still to move to Missouri by August of 2018. The judge declined to make the change to the order that both parties had signed because, again, they both agreed to it. They both said that they would do this and there shouldn't have been any issues until Veronica changed her mind. Ten days after that, Ron filed a notice with the court which notified them of his new address in Missouri. This move was scheduled for mid-August of 2018. However, that move would never happen for the girls. On August 5th, 2018, 911 operator Jennifer Heflin answered a call where she heard the voice of a 15-year-old girl crying in pain and begging for help, saying that she had just been shot. When the dispatcher asked this young girl who shot her, she said, my mom. She told the dispatcher that her mom came into her room while she and her little sister were sleeping and her mom told her that she was going to take her to see God before shooting her. Of course, this 15-year-old teenager was Sharon Castro. The dispatcher told her that help was coming, and she listened to her as she screamed out, moaning in pain and terror. She kept telling the dispatcher, I don't want to die. Please help me. Finally, by 10.15 p.m., help arrived to the apartment at 1519 Lincoln Circle. In the apartment, they found Sharon, who had been shot twice. She had one gunshot wound to her back and one to her chest. Then, the paramedics found five-year-old Brooklyn dead in her bed. She died from a single gunshot wound to her head. But at this point, Sharon was still alive, and she was still clinging to life. She was immediately rushed to the hospital, but unfortunately, she did not survive. She fought as hard as she could but she passed away just days later at the hospital. But when the police got there, both their mother and father were nowhere to be found, but thankfully, Veronica would be found later that same night. After the children were shot, Veronica went to a friend's house, which we will discuss later, knocked on his front door, carrying a gun. 
At that point, the friend called 911 and she was quickly apprehended. When police arrested her, they found that she was still carrying a handgun. She was also driving a rental car at the time. Then in the car, police found two magazines and ammunition for the gun. When she was interviewed just hours after shooting her children, she admitted to the police that she bought a gun with the plan to kill her children and then kill herself. She said that her life just was not a good one, but she didn't give any further details. Then police found out that just after the murders, Veronica had actually called Ron to let him know that she had just killed the girls and she was going to kill herself and she said that she hated him. In that police interview, Veronica said, I'm guilty. When the investigator asked her what her punishment should be, she said the death penalty, even though the death penalty is not a thing anymore in Virginia. The officers in this interview claim that she talked this whole time in a very blank, emotionless fashion. Buy a gun and kill my daughter, Sammy. So to buy a gun and kill your daughters and yourself? Yes. I am guilty. So your punishment should be what? Death penalty. Death penalty. So because of this, of course, Veronica was charged for first degree murder for the deaths of her two young children. In her first hearing, she told the court that she did not want counsel. She said that she didn't want to hire a private lawyer, but she also didn't want a public defender. But she did end up getting a lawyer after all, and in her plea hearing, she pled not guilty due to reason of insanity. Now, each hearing in her case was delayed, and each of them took months to happen. Her probable cause hearing was delayed for several months because Veronica repeatedly refused to leave jail to attend other hearings. According to her public defender, she had also tried to kill herself multiple times during this time. But finally, her trial did start in March of this year, 2023. The prosecution argued that she was not insane. This was a methodical planned plot to murder her two daughters in order to get revenge on her ex-husband. The murders took place only a few days before Brooklyn and Ron were scheduled to move to Missouri. She had just gone through these nasty divorce proceedings and she was just trying to get revenge. The prosecution laid out the whole timeline, which showed the planning. It turned out that nine days before the murders, Veronica went to a local gun show where she purchased a handgun. The prosecution argued that she did so with the express purpose of murdering her children. Then it was said that the day before the shooting, Sharon asked her mother if she was planning on killing her and her sister. I saw that stated in like the documents, but I didn't see much more about that. But if that's true, that's horrifying and sickening. The prosecution argued that she contemplated these murders for days. They said that on the day of the murders, she gave both children gummies, which contained sleeping medicine, to prevent them from being able to fight her back. Then, she went into the, each of their rooms and shot each one of her daughters. When describing the shooting of Sharon, it's very rough and huge trigger warning. I'm sure if you're still watching at this point, you're already prepared but it's still really bad, the whole situation for how this went down. They said that Veronica first shot Brooklyn once in her head and she died immediately. But with Sharon, she was shot once, but she woke up and she was screaming. Sharon asked her mother why she shot her and Veronica said that she was going to take her to meet God, as I mentioned earlier. Then she shot Sharon once more time in the chest before fleeing the apartment. Then she called Ron, leaving him a voice message saying, I killed Brooklyn. I killed Sharon. I'm going to kill myself. I hate you. Bye. The prosecution argued that Veronica is a manipulative liar. She lies, ensues chaos, and manipulates all for personal gain. She is spiteful, selfish, vengeful, and calculated. They said that she had a choice for everything that she did. She planned and executed a plot to murder her children just to get back at her ex-husband. However, the defense argued that she is just mentally ill. They argued that she was at the mercy of a cruel and violent man who abused her. 
They argued that Ron had physically abused her, that he never loved her, and that she already suffered this lifetime of abuse in her childhood. Once again, they brought up how she and her little sister grew up in extreme poverty. She talked about how she was sexually abused by her grandfather. She said that she was beaten on a daily basis by her mother and father who would beat her until she couldn't walk. She said that her father would use branches, belts, and a broomstick to beat her. She said that after that, after growing up with all this abuse, her parents just up and left, abandoning her and her little sister to completely fend for themselves. Again, she talked about how she felt like she had to get into sex work to feed her daughter and to support her little sister. Her little sister also took the stand to talk about how growing up, Veronica practiced the South American religion called Ubanda. In this religion, they believed that there is a supreme creator God. They believe that there is a medium to contact the spirits of dead people, and they believe in reincarnation and spiritual evolution through many physical practices. This is really just a very small summary of this religion, but basically the defense used it to try and say that she had this belief that she could speak with dead people. So, with all of that, the defense argued that because of her history of abuse and neglect, in addition to this religion, she was severely mentally ill. At one point, she said that she heard voices all throughout her life. Then, at the trial, she actually said that she heard voices that night, which told her to murder her children. The defense said that she suffered from complex post-traumatic stress disorder and a long-standing history of depression. They argued that she was in a mortal fear that the same abuse that happened to her growing up would also happen to her children if they were separated from her in this move across, you know, the country to a different state. They talked about how she had asked the cops for the death penalty, saying that this was a clear indication that she was suicidal and wanted to die. During the trial, of course, they heard testimony from different individuals who knew Veronica. They heard from the medics who tried saving Sharon's life and different people who knew them and their relationship. One witness was a man named Manuel Leva. He was a defense attorney who was casually dating Veronica at the time that all of this happened. He said that they had met back in the summer of 2018. When they had first met, he said that Veronica seemed very laid back and put together. But by the end of July, he said that everything changed. He said that at the end of July, she confided in him that she had lost her nursing job. This was probably the same job that she told the court about for why she couldn't move to Missouri. Either way, she told him that she was looking for a more serious relationship at that time, but Miguel said that he wasn't ready for anything serious. So, at that time, they both decided to end their relationship. But a few days after they broke up, Veronica sent him a text message saying that she was actually pregnant with his child. So, Miguel went to her apartment on July 31st to discuss the pregnancy, but when he got there, he said that all of the lights in the apartment were off and there were candles everywhere. I guess the two did end up speaking, but he said that he left shortly after because he was actually afraid for his safety. There wasn't much more that went into that, but it must have just been a really strange, weird situation for him to feel like he was not safe in her presence. He said that after this conversation, he didn't even think that Veronica was being truthful about the pregnancy. And as far as I've seen, I don't think she was really pregnant because there were no reports of her having a baby or a miscarriage or anything else like that in jail while awaiting trial. But after that day, Miguel had his attorney send Veronica a letter instructing her not to contact Miguel again. He said that the next time he saw Veronica was on August 5th when she showed up on his doorstep. He said that she was calm and stone-faced, asking him to come inside of his house. He said that he didn't open the door because he was afraid of what was going on and asked her to leave. He told her that he didn't want to get the police involved, but she told him to call the police anyways because they were already looking for her. He said that he asked her, why are they looking for you? And he said that she said, because I just killed my daughters. 
he said that that is when she pulled the gun out of her waistband and told him why she did it. Then he called 911 to report this. So this is the story that I mentioned earlier, how she ended up on this friend's doorstep with a gun and this friend called 911 to come and arrest Veronica. Then in the trial, the prosecution started playing the 911 call for the jury. The 911 call that Sharon made where she told the dispatcher that she was dying because her mom had just shot her. But almost as soon as the 911 call started to play, Veronica screamed and said, I can't, and stood up from the defense table. The judge then called a recess and told the jurors that Veronica had asked to be excused while this 911 call was playing. So that's pretty much what both sides had argued. Veronica did take the stand herself at one point, coming to tears, talking about the trauma that she went through. The jury was also seen in tears, you know, dabbing their tears as she was talking about all of the horrible things that she had gone through in her life. Ron was also at trial, sitting stoically in the back as the courts went through the evidence. He also took the stand to talk about how much of a miracle children were, how much he loved both girls, and how devastated he is that he lost the both of them. After two weeks of trial, both sides had their closing arguments. The prosecution, in their closing arguments, urged the jury to find Veronica guilty. She bought that handgun nine days before the murder. She gave them sleeping gummies so that they would be defenseless. The prosecution called her a malicious, selfish, deliberate killer. There wasn't this way that she just snapped and murdered her daughters and had no idea what she was doing because she had planned this nine days prior and she had planned it during the day. So it's not like she just randomly decided to do this and kill her children last minute because of a moment of insanity. In the defense, in their closing arguments, they said that Veronica was mentally ill and that she didn't snap to kill her daughters, she slid. After suffering a lifetime of abuse, she was mentally ill and she killed her children to protect them from facing the same abuse that she did as a child. So again, after two weeks of trial, the jury was sent off for their deliberations. After about a day of deliberations, they came back with their verdict. They found that Veronica was not mentally insane at the time of the murders, and they found her guilty in the first-degree murders of her daughters, 5-year-old Brooklyn and 15-year-old Sharon, as well as for using a firearm during a crime. Next came time for the penalty phase. At the penalty hearing, the jury came back and decided that prison is the best option for Veronica. But as they were deciding her sentence, Veronica had an outburst. She screamed, no, no, and leapt out of her chair, having to be wrestled back by court officials. She screamed out at Ron, who was sitting in the back of the courtroom. She yelled, why did you leave me? Why did you leave me alone with the girls? None of this would have happened. After the outburst, the judge sent the jurors home for the night and Veronica returned to jail. She was placed on suicide watch for that night. Then, a few days later, the jury returned to the court where they sentenced Veronica to 36 years for each murder and three years each for using a firearm. In total, she will be serving 78 years in prison. So, that is the information that I have on today's case. It's truly, truly a devastating situation. I do think that throughout the entire relationship, the both of them were the cause of abuse towards one another. I obviously do think that there was something mentally wrong with her for thinking that murdering her own children would get the revenge that she wanted for her ex-husband. But at the same time, I do think that she planned this. I do think that she is truly an evil human being, but I don't think that Ron is the greatest person either. I think that a lot of Veronica's past does play into how she was as a person and the things that she put up with with Ron and vice versa. I think that maybe she did kill her children to avoid them being with Ron, but also there was this agreement where she would split custody with him. I don't think that that was a good argument to make that, oh, you know, she was afraid that if they were apart from her that they would face the same abuse that she did because one, 
Sharon, she had full custody of Sharon. The only child that would be leaving was Brooklyn. And in this situation, she didn't even have to leave Brooklyn. All she had to do was move to Missouri as she previously agreed. And if she just did that, then there would be no situation where Brooklyn would be that far away from her. They would have split custody between the two of them. So I don't think that was a very smart argument to make. I think that she planned this. I do think that she killed her children because Ron was going to take Brooklyn. What I cannot understand is why she would have murdered Sharon because she would have had Sharon anyways. As far as I know, the only child that they would have had split custody between was Brooklyn, but don't quote me on that. I'm not 100% sure. I didn't see anything about Sharon anywhere and, you know, Ron's involvement in all of that, but I do not understand her thinking. I think it was selfish. I do think that it was just her in a moment of saying, you know, if you're not going to let me have them, if they're not totally mine, if you're going to try to take them away from me, then I'm just going to take them away from you. That is truly what I think happened. And it's just a horrible situation because he wasn't even fully taking the children away from her because she agreed. She agreed to this move to Missouri so that they could live closer to Ron's family. And some might say that he coerced her. Some might say that she was forced to. No matter the situation, she did agree. And it's not like he was taking the children away from her indefinitely. He didn't file for full custody of Brooklyn to move. He didn't do any of that. He did agree to all of these different things to split custody, to paying for an apartment, to doing all of that just so he could live closer to his family and so that she could come with and still be able to see her daughter. So again, just based off of things that I've seen, I don't think that Ron is the best guy. I don't think he's a stand-up guy, but I also don't think that he was abusive towards the children. None of that was ever brought up. There was never any allegations that he was ever abusive towards the children. And according to court documents, there was never a time that he was fully trying to take the children away. He was always cool with split custody. He was always okay with helping support Veronica and the children. That's all I'll say about that. Again, I do think they were abusive towards each other. And obviously, these children did not have the best environment growing up to begin with, but again, that does not mean that Veronica got to murder them just to keep them away from her ex-husband. It's a horrible situation overall. My heart goes out to the children, to the family, and to everybody else who loved them. But that is all of the information that I have for today's case, and now I want to hear what you guys think. Do you think that she truly was insane and didn't know what she was doing at the time of these murders? Or do you think that this was a planned, cold-blooded murder? Or do you think something else was going on? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and fill out the Google form that I have listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.